someone who's played seemingly kind of played the tabloids at their own game, probably because of his insider knowledge, is Boris Johnson, who you worked with. I mean, the question I suppose a lot of people in this room might have, given the news of the last week, is what is Boris Johnson like? That who is the person who we don't see in those tabloid headlines? Mm. So he is a he is a newspaper guy more than anything. He um, I think he would love to edit. The Telegraph, maybe, or or obviously enjoyed editing oh, The tough. Spectator. Buy it. And he was very, very interested. Maybe he'll buy it. And he was very, very interested at our morning meetings every morning of like what the editorial line was in every newspaper. Um, because that's really how he thought. He thought in kind of headlines. Um, what is he like? Uh, he's obviously quite... He's very charismatic to be around, and and he can be sort of irresistibly charming, really, um, though not sexy, to be clear. Um, <laughs> and um, and I could see here, and he could really be engaging. The slight problem was is that he kind of pandered to an audience. So if a meeting was quite big, say, the, around the cabinet table, he couldn't resist sort of performing and not necessarily thinking how do I chair this meeting and get the best out of it and you know people often say he's more of a campaigner than a, a kind of an administrator or governor or technocrat and I think that makes quite a lot of sense um, and I think perhaps my other thought is I've just never met someone as chaotic as him in my life and someone who he really thrives off it he likes what, like living at a pitch that the rest of us would just hate so I was thinking about him this week and he's probably happy as a clam. Like, just everyone's talking about him and is he going to be an MP anymore? Is it all going to come out okay? We don't know. And I look back to stages where, you know, we, we'd, I guess the two different ones, we'd just prorogued Parliament. He was perhaps going to be the shortest serving Prime Minister in history. He now had a, minor, a full minority government. The whole thing was perhaps going to go off the hill. He was getting divorced. Little known to us, he secretly had a baby on the way. <laughs> what? Maybe little known to him. He was like, Matt, you know, God knows what his finances were doing. Like, what, what a kind of way to live. And he couldn't have been happier. <laughs> Tom, you wrote what's considered kind of the definitive profile of Boris Johnson. Do you have, do you concur with Cleo's assessment of his psychology? Yeah, I mean, talking the way you were talking about him as a um, as a journalist and almost being prime minister like he was an editor again. So you, having the morning conference in the morning, essentially, and having these journalist friends around him. So you had James Slack and James Doyle, who were from the Daily Mail, and they'd been very senior journalists, and they knew how morning conference worked. They knew how af afternoon conference worked, and they just explained him. As a as an editor, you know, they re he reminded them of Dacre or or any of these big figures that they'd had to deal with before their egos and the chaos. Yeah, I remember having this line in my head that the the chaos with Boris was both performative and real at the same time, and that was the thing to try and get your head around with him. That he he liked the chaos, and he actively made life more chaotic when whenever you, you saw him and made it funny and people were always laughing around him. So he, he did play that up, but it was also true, and that's like what brought him down. Like his finances were chaotic, his um, doing the Downing Street flat was chaotic, the way he ran, uh, ran Downing Street was chaotic. You know, he would say things I was told later, like, oh, who, who am I seeing again, Tom? What have, what, am I, what have I agreed to him to do? And I was like, you've agreed to let me in and come and interview you like three times, you know, <laughs> but he just hadn't a clue. But on the journalism point, just very quickly, he loved talking to journalists and editors, and it was not unusual to kind of send him up in the evening, having done his box work, and he was going to go out for dinner, and everything was under control. He knew exactly what decisions he'd made that day. And then we'd open the papers the next day and think, what the hell? <laughs> and, he, and, and I can remember we were, in, we were in one of these morning meetings, and it was the front page of The Telegraph, and Lee Kane, who's the director of communication, said, where the hell has this come from? We're going we're gonna to catch this leaker. Don't want, and, and Boris went, oh, yeah, that might have been me, actually. <laughs> and he just called up Chris Evans or whoever that evening. And that, you know, that, was a, that was a problem, that in the chaos, 
and with his phone, he well, could. What was the other thing? Was it the, what, the WhatsApps? He would he would be WhatsApping with Macron or other world leaders, and that's he liked that obviously. And he was away from the civil servants, being able to control it, and and eventually. The phone was taken away from him yeah. by the <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> by the security services, right? And it was yeah. it's locked in a box now, essentially. Yeah, it's like you can't share memes with like MBS anymore. It's <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to see those. Oh, yeah, me too. You said in a in a Tatler piece um, that you felt sometimes like a nanny mm. um, to a lot of these male older politicians. Was was Boris one of those charges in your new nannying business? Yeah, I think he was. He was the only one really, and. I think that it, it's very specific, the chronology, because this is after he'd had COVID. So he came out of ICU, obviously he'd been incredibly unwell. And one of the problems really with the kind of British state is that the constitution is just not set up for a politician feeling a bit under the weather. If you're prime minister, you've got to be taking these decisions. And so in order for Chris Whitty and Patrick Vallance and whoever to get the decisions they needed, my job was to kind of have him ready for the meetings at nine and 11 and one and whatever. And if that meant making sure he was eating the right foods or getting enough rest or having a little nap or whatever needed to happen, then that's what happened. And, and truthfully, I mean, I think, I think it is, you can see it quite often with um, MPs who become ministers. They just suddenly have this kind of scaffolding around them and they, can become quite childlike, where they just are used to having people scurrying around and doing stuff for them. And you particularly see this once they leave government and they're back on the back benches and they're just flailing around and they, they really don't know what they're doing anymore and sort of sucking their thumbs. Um, but it's probably my fault that I kind of allowed myself to fall into that nannying role, but it, it just had to be done because he'd just eat sausages all the time and, <laughs> like just sleep his way through meetings, so. Johnson seems to know how to use the funny things he does in a way that other politicians don't. And I think that does tie him into figures like Trump as distinct from perhaps figures like DeSantis or Rishi Sunak, who's, yeah, he's who quite, seem to operate but not quite know how to use that. But that's sort of right, thing. he's quite a sort of slapstick politician. And um, I was reading this great piece that you referenced on your podcast yesterday, actually, by Jonathan Coe yes, in um, yeah. the LRB, which is all about um, kind of satire in, in, in politics over really since the 60s. Yeah. And the idea really being that Johnson, if you look back to his kind of um, Have I Got News For You era and then as mayor of London and all these kind of skits, essentially, he was prepared to do. I mean... I've never seen anything like it. All the kind of gimmicks that we came up with during the general election and even as prime minister, he was just totally fine with doing, even though the opportunity for humiliation was so obvious and high and his kind of risk reward. But he embraced it. He, yeah, want, he wanted to Because he also doesn't care yeah. if he looks silly and he kind of, he acts like he's in on the joke and that he's kind of making it happen and he rolls his eyes and... You know, you're starting to see Matt Hancock trying to do that, where I saw this, I saw this awful, I really got it on the mind, but he did this weird video yesterday of him like ranking his favorite drinks on TikTok. It's like, hey kids, oh, I'm having a blue WKD or whatever. And, and you just thought, I see what you're trying to do. You're trying to you're kind of work. make yourself a figure of fun, but you still take yourself too seriously. And so I think you're right. He, he is able to kind of do this, kind of sense of humour, I'm a goon shtick. I think though that the public are less convinced that that's authentic. He was able to seem quite authentic when he did it. And I think particularly with like this week where he is looking pretty Trumpian, um, I think a lot of that stuff is looking less charming. Mm. Yeah, the LRB piece is called Sink Sinking Giggling Into the Sea. Yeah. And it's, it's really good and it sort of traces the satire uh, the satire of politicians all the way back into the 60s and says, you know, if you if you end up with a with all politicians just all being shits and laughing stock, then the the best way to get around that is just to satire yourself, laugh, laugh at yourself before others do it and make yourself a kind of lovable rogue, which is what Boris Johnson was able to do. And then he was he was um, 
he was kind of, he'd won because nobody else could take the mick better than he was already doing. Mm. And if he falls over in a game of rugby, that's funny, but he's, he's done it. We're talking about beyond parody. If you make yeah. yourself beyond parody, there is, a, right, there is yeah. a real power in that. I think Trump, <laughs> Trump has also simultaneously managed to do that. I don't know if, I, they're often compared. They're kind of these quite hulking blonde men yeah. um, with this oddly humorous persona. Do you think there is more to it than just that? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I there's obviously been some discussion about whether he kind of wears this mask and whether it's sort of got melded to his face. Um, and, you know, obviously he, amongst his family, he's still called Alexander, but he's got this kind of Boris, not even Johnson, Boris persona uh, publicly. Um, and he, you know, he, he can be a huge amount of fun. He can do these little gimmicks and, and jokes and particularly in the kind of initial interaction you have with him, you walk away feeling quite sort of flushed and buzzed by the whole thing. And that's normally about as much interaction as people have with him. So they come away thinking, wow, that was so fun. But when it's day in, day out, and you're trying to get him to make some quite big decisions, it's so, it's so unbelievably annoying. <laughs> and like the, just the charm melts off it. And then when he gets angry, it just completely evaporates and... It's what they say about drug addicts, it's the pleasure, then the pleasure and the consequences, and then you're just left with the consequences. Big time. Well, Dom, <laughs> didn't, didn't Dom used to sort of get really annoyed with people who carried on laughing at him? So stop fucking laughing at him, you know, and ma would make it an order. <laughs> yeah, well, what ended up happening is people stopped laughing, but he would... He does this kind of, like look like that and so people would just do that back to him so you'd be sitting in meetings and just thinking what the hell is going <laughs> on there's people like squinting at each other do you think a, la a kind of chronic lack of seriousness was the start of what we now can trace back to during covid that kind of beginning of the loss of trust that that seemed to happen and and the piling up of more and more lies upon lies or is that something that has always existed in westminster I mean, my only comparison is working for Theresa May, who obviously, were, you know, was arguably too serious for some people. Um, but I think that I don't think I don't think serious a lack of seriousness was necessarily his his kind of problem as prime minister. I think it was just almost a, a disinterest in how and how things should happen. So he once sent a group of us this very very long email of his priorities, but he wrote at the bottom, don't talk to me about priorities, all of these things need to happen, so don't try and like tell me in what order they should, I want them all. And they were things like, education, make it better. <laughs> and he was just genuinely agnostic on like how we should do that, which is kind, which is obviously very interesting in some ways, but it is problematic if you don't really have a huge number of ideas of your own and I suppose that is an I, I suppose that is a lack of seriousness in a way but but it's it's like I've I've done the campaigning I can deliver the package I can do the media lines I can bring up the editors the proprietors or whatever I can sell it you just have to tell me what it is mm -hmm. um, and that's how you can see how that works very well in the 2019 general election because you had people like Dominic Cummings who put the strategy together put the messaging together and even though there were various sort of cock-ups, like getting stuck in fridges and things, Boris is basically willing to go out and deliver it, and he he's was very the disciplined. spokesperson. Yeah. He, during a campaign, you can see it switch on, can't you? And yeah. he, he won't veer off the lines that he's being told. And I always thought that was quite telling, because, you know, he, he can have the chaos around him, and he can still make the jokes, but he's not going to go off that line that Linton or Dom or yeah. whoever has told him. Well, and he is quite motivated by fear, I think, too. So the most focused, I think, that I found him to work with was August 2019 to December 2019. That period of obvious chaos, which was everything going on in his life, but this, this kind of scythe hanging over him that he could be the shortest serving prime minister ever. Mm. And that just made him much more amenable to doing what he had to do, getting his work done. Certainly that was like the, the height of his, the, like the best part of his relationship with Cummings. Um, and the problem was, and I guess this falls into your lack of seriousness point, 
after the 2019 general election, he was safe. He didn't have any fears. And that's when he ultimately relaxed and it was just very difficult to get him motivated into... This is the classic character of the CAD who always has to have some fear of being found out weighing over them to mm. motivate them to do anything. It's, totally. It's like, it's, well, it's, a, it's, it's a journalist, a it's, a, it's a deadline. Yeah. It's, a, it's a newspaper deadline <laughs> and he didn't have it anymore. And I can remember you know, the earliest fights were things like HS2 and Huawei and he was like boosterism, boosterism, leveling up, let's just say yes to everything. And the, like Huawei, there were pretty major questions about whether that should go ahead or not. And obviously HS2 we're still talking about as well. And that was really, I think, partly in, in his relationship with Cummings, why you could just see the wheels starting to come off because he just sort of didn't have any worries anymore. Well, of course, Boris has written a novel himself that I've of just course. remembered. Yeah. And it features a caddish Tory MP mm -hmm. who cycles to work mm -hmm. and <laughs> has this dark secret hanging over him for the entire novel that you then discover at the end. And it's all... A nice child. <laughs> <laughs> it's all sexual innuendo and all of that. And it's, uh, and it's there. And it's actually while he's, um, he's having an affair at the time. It's very strange psychology that he is writing about this character that is obviously him with mm. this dark secret while he has a dark secret and he's not yet got to the place that he wants to get well, to. Again, it's back to the shamelessness, the stranger than fiction element. It's almost, if you write it down, if you're honest, it's like the best tip for shoplifters, not that we would have any in the room, of course, <laughs> is to just walk out with the thing in your hand because the most brazen thing you can do is the least noticeable. Mm. And in a way, writing his story, his deeper secrets down, is the CAD thing. It's to explode yourself. What he's doing in those meetings when he's gurning at people across the table is to let them know, I'm, I, you know, this is chaos, this is chaos. And maybe people are attracted to that. Maybe that is just a, a magnetism that we can't, we don't find in other politicians. I wonder, I suppose, to, to round off this section, why it's particularly conservatives who seem to have this um, this issue with a kind of combination of sleaze and charisma um, that comes together because it feels so oppositional to what we think of as a conservative in our culture. It's conservative men. It seems conservative men who you would think perhaps might be prudish and Jacob Reeks moggish, and but it turns out no, there is this other breed. Um, what do you think it is about them that makes them like this? Well. You're definitely right that I'm not sure we can accuse the Labour Party of having a charisma problem. Um, but, <laughs> not too much, but, uh, not an but, overdose. But, but, but a bit of sleaze in there. Um, I, I honestly don't know. I mean, I, I, I do feel like this is a very specific period in time for some of these characters. And I don't know how much of it is really the incentive of MPs, particularly in the governing party, it, their, their incentives are all wrong, I think. They think in like terms of column inches and kind of appearances on television and how many pe followers they have on Twitter and not necessarily how many private members' bills they're doing and how much, you know, which way they're voting and how much legislation they're overseeing. And, of course, there's this terrible rat run to try and get on the career ladder and become a minister, which is, you know, a big... There's rumours of reshuffle now and I think that's probably feeding into some of the fever at the moment. Truthfully, I don't know. I just think there are these kind of heated periods of sleaze and charisma that come together a little bit. I think perhaps not helped by a couple of general elections now of people on, in, in both Labour and, and the Tories perhaps who wouldn't have won their seats if they had been quote, normal general elections. So there were a lot of no hope of people who won Labour seats in 2017 and then Tories in 2019. And ultimately, it's a, it's a tough system to live and work in. And some people survive and even thrive in it. And some people don't and get chewed up quite badly by it. And maybe it's some of these kind of char charismatic characters who been a bit more trained up to it. They've come through these systems of Eton or the Oxford Union or whatever, or, you know, a newsroom, and they understand a bit more about what to expect.